This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Thank you very much, Raf. Thank you for inviting me. Um, I should also introduce um, Charlotte Tupman, who's going to be working with us uh, on, on the project as well, and um, will perhaps be able to help us answer questions at the end. As you can see from the array of institutional logos here, um, this is a multi-institutional project and I should also um, acknowledge the uh, contribution of the Arts and Humanities Research Council to, to this, um, which I have omitted to do on the, on the front of this presentation. Um, so the aim is to introduce the project on historical pageants, to draw perhaps on some of the work that I've done already on the pageants at St Albans. Uh, in the 20th century and from other pageants as well. I hope this fits into the theme of the seminar series. Um, historical pageantry at least was um, a way in which thousands, probably millions of people um, spent some of their leisure time in communities across Britain for, for large parts of the 20th century. What's a historical pageant? It's uh, this, a reenactment of successive episodes in the history of a town or a city or an organisation. An event where a group of people, um, <clears throat> could be a church, could be a village, uh, reenacts a series of scenes from its own history. A very widespread form of popular engagement with the past in um, certain parts of 20th century Britain uh, and elsewhere as well, notably in the Edwardian period, during the interwar years and in the early post-war period between 1945 and about 1955. A typical historical pageant would have around 10 scenes, maybe more, maybe fewer, of local history, each very often with a very large cast and the total number of performances would often be over a thousand. The study of pageants, I think, participates in several productive areas of research, including modern urban culture and governance, um, the role of history in public life in the 20th century, and indeed since. Um, so far, only one monograph has been devoted to the topic by Ayako Yoshino, um, <clears throat> which deals only with the period before the First World War. And I'm going to talk a bit about that period to start with, but I'm going to go on to um, think about what's happening in historical pageantry during the interwar and early post-war periods. So, I think it's reasonably well known that the Edwardian period saw an outbreak of um, what was contemporaneously referred to as pageant fever or pageantitis. Um, very many historical pageants being held in towns, often smallish towns with long histories, um, but also pageants with national and imperial dimensions. The Scottish historical pageant, for example, at Craig Miller Castle. More than 40 pageants of this kind before the First World War, including an army pageant, an English church pageant, pageant of London. Um, and often, as I said before, with very large casts. So to give some figures from Paul's article, The Place of the Past in um, English History, um, there were more than 800 performers at Sherbourne in 1905, which um, was directed, produced by Louis Napoleon Parker, often considered to be the first of the, of the modern historical pageants. Um, 2,000 at Bury St Edmunds, 3,000 at Bath, um, 3,500 at Chester and um, at Frank LaSalle's London pageant of 1911, um, 15,000 performers. Um, grandstands were usually erected for these occasions, the capacity often being you know, as, as, as large as 4,000 or, or even more. And there will be several performances at each pageant, so the audience could range into the, into the tens of thousands the total audience in, in some cases. And as you can see, um, some people in this period were um, serial pageant masters. Um, the two best known are undoubtedly Louis Napoleon Parker and Frank Lascelles, um, both of whom produced pageants in slightly different ways, which I won't, won't go into here. But as you can see, they um, went back year after year and um, did pageants, uh, often um, very lucrative for them personally, in many different communities up and down the country. Um, and I think this is often recognised in, in the literature, but perhaps less, less often acknowledged is the continuing vitality of um, historical pageantry after the First World War. Um, and there were 
many more historical pageants throughout the interwar period and often on just as big a scale and there are various examples up here I've put the Harrow historical pageant of 1923 as an example three and a half thousand performers Frank Lascelles again the the producer or, or pageant master as they were normally called. Uh, another Scottish historical pageant at Craig Miller Castle. Uh, the Taunton pageant of 1928, 1500 uh, performers has attracted some, some scholarship in the form of Michael Woods's article in the Journal of Historical Geography called Performing Power. Um, a whole series of examples pretty much chosen at, at random from the 1930s just to show that up and down Britain this, this phenomenon was uh, continuing and in many cases flourishing in, in communities large and small. Um, <clears throat> the form, again the form of successive, reenactment re of successive scenes was adopted by um, institutions, organisations and political causes. So as Mick Wallace has shown in a series of articles in the New Theatre Quarterly, for example, um, there were popular front pageants which presented a fairly explicit political message. Uh, Helen McCarthy has recently written about internationalist pageants of the interwar period staged by branches of the League of Nations Union um, and other organisations. It was a very diverse and very adaptable form which could serve many purposes, including um, Women's Institute and Cooperative Guild pageants depicting um, women's history and um, pageants devoted to specific professions, history of nursing, for example, in 1932 and, and 1937. And it's very easy to find pictures of pageants. Um, just go on to the internet and, and find them. You can find videos as well, for that matter. Um, and here's just one example from the 1930s, um, the Stoke-on-Trent pageant. Um, and you can see the kind of size, the scale of what's going on in a fairly typical um, pageant of, of the time. Not sure exactly what's being reenacted in, in, this, in this scene, but you can see the kind of scale of event that, that we're talking about. I think even more underrepresented in the literature um, is the flourishing nature of historical pageantry after the Second World War. Uh, I'm going to be saying a bit more about the St Albans Millenary Pageant of 1948, but it's um, much more than what Yoshino calls a brief revival of historical pageantry after the Second World War. Um, I think there may well have been a higher incidence of pageantry in these periods than, than, than in, in any other. Um, although there's no doubt that the historical pageant, certainly on a large scale, was in um, <coughs> rapid decline by the late 1950s. And the phenomenon, although it has never quite died out, certainly doesn't uh, exist on the same scale as, as it did in the 40s and 50s. And we can think about some reasons for that maybe later on. The Festival of Britain and the coronation of 1953, uh, unsurprisingly, are two events around which historical pageantry often coalesce. There were many coronation pageants that adopted the same form as earlier historical pageants. Again, it's an excuse to put a historical pageant on, and the Festival of Britain had similar, uh, or a similar regional impact in, in this respect. Just a few examples there. Carlisle, Siren, Sester, Warwick Castle, Camders, Langclack, Man and Kingsland, Wisbeach, Trafford Park, annual every year from 1950 to 57 approximately in Manchester, Brighton, Bradford, and, and so on. There's an awful lot of pageants going on in this period, as you can see. And it's remarkable, I think, to me that so few historians have, have picked up on, on the importance of this. At St Albans in 1953, when they had another pageant there, there were more than 1,600 performers, a grandstand that could seat 4,000. It's on the same kind of scale as, as the pageantitis of the Edwardian period. Also, pageants that picked up on industrial history, the Sheffield pageant of production, um, the Communist Manifesto centenary pageant, 
1948 and um, a history of policing pageants, uh, one of which was, was um, cancelled because of the rain. Um, and um, Oh, that's it. There we go. There were others as well. Um, in total, we found around 400 historical pageants that have left some kind of archival record. Um, and literally thousands of pageants that have that happened and have left some kind of record, for example, in the local press or, or elsewhere. Um, this 400 is the tip of a, a very large iceberg to use a rather hackneyed metaphor. And this is not to mention even the um, hundreds of pageant plays that were performed up and down the country, indoors, in schools and churches, village halls, scout troops, youth clubs, adult education organisations, amateur dramatic clubs, and so on. Historical pageants have never totally died out. Um, there are brief revivals in the 1970s, um, around the time of the millennium, and I know of at least one historical pageant that's being planned for, for Bury St Edmunds in 2014 that will um, tie in with, with Magna Carta, of course, the celebrations of that. And it's very possible that with these centenaries that are coming up of Bannockburn, the First World War, Magna Carta, Agincourt, Waterloo, that we might see um, a revival of pageant fever, another outbreak um, of this particular virulence at, um, in the next few years. Particularly if people get to know about our project and are, are inspired by it. This is some examples here of some post-war pageants. Um, Carlisle, Guildford was quite an interesting one. I'll, I'll come back to that maybe later. There's time. The pageant of Maybole, again, just to prove this is <laughs> happening in, in, in Scotland and, and to a lesser extent Wales as well. Um, and there is a huge range of um, ephemera and publications associated with, with pageants. Many produced postcards, almost all of them have some kind of souvenir program like the one shown here. Uh, and um, many of them were an excuse to sell all sorts of, of trinkets and, and so on to visitors and members of the community. So what then should we make of all this? Um, what can we learn from this really largely forgotten phenomenon? And of course there are many important debates on, on the place of the past in English history, um, which Paul and others, for example, have, have contributed to. Um, Jerome de Groot, in his recent book, Consuming History, 2009, asserts that, quote, how a society consumes its history is crucial to the understanding of contemporary popular culture, the issues at stake in representation itself, and the various means of self or social consumption available. Consumption practices influence what is packaged as history and work to define how the past manifests itself in society. We're hoping we can learn something about British society at various times from the way in which communities presented their own past. How did past societies understand and, and use their own histories? What was the role, what was the status of heritage in various times in the 20th century? What was the um, the balance of no, national, local and imperial identities that were presented and reflected in the content and organisation of, of pageants. And to what extent, I suppose, did, did pageants function as, as key moments in the social history of their communities, as the producers of pageants certainly wanted them to do. These events were envisaged as being key um, moments in themselves. In the, in the social history of the communities that put them on. I would also emphasise that pageants need to be seen like historical reenactment more generally, I think, as um, embodiments of popular education. And certainly they were seen and presented in this way by many of their most enthusiastic 
promoters. The obsession with authenticity, the importance of the place, the use of correct costumes, all key aspects of historical pageantry. Louis Napoleon Parker got very upset when anyone um, introduced an anachronism, looking at their watch or um, taking a photograph while they're meant to be playing in an Elizabethan scene or a Magna Carta scene or something like that. Um, contemporaneous observers in the Edwardian period really fetishised the, the community education element of pageants, even, even arguing that it was best if parts were played by their direct descendants. Um, Script writers were at pains to emphasise the historical accuracy of their source material, to give references um, in many cases. <coughs> De Groot argues, considering um, historical reenactment societies such as the Sealed Knot, argues that they, they have a performative educational function that goes beyond their status as, as entertainment and, and fun. Um, indeed, Her Majesty's Customs and Excise agreed, um, and uh, pageants were exempted from the entertainment tax that was levied between the 1940s and, um, and 1960. Um, Stafford Cripps, in fact, um, was very keen that pageants should be performed um, during the 1940s. The, the idea of a usable past, um, communities spent a lot of time organising, writing and um, staging these things and they had, as I'm going to argue, very often a, a contemporaneous purpose or several purposes. Um, they worked for the present in some way, it's going to be a big part of, of the argument. The way in which they did this was very closely related to the approach they took to the past. De Groot argues, again, again in the context of, of reenactment societies, but I think also applicable to pageants, that, that this kind of activity demonstrates faith in the educational virtue of historical embodiment, to use his words. These are, these are more than just fun. They're more than just um, theatrical spectacle. But at the same time, of course, they are spectacle. And indeed, they... Um, they <coughs> tread an uneasy path, the promoters of pageants, between education and performance, between spectacle and um, being informative. Um, the dialogue, of course, has to be made up. Most pageants were, did feature dialogue, very few of them did not. Um, has to be made up or borrowed from literary sources, it's the nature of, nature of, the, of the game. Um, we don't know who said what to whom. So quite predictably, many borrow from Shakespeare, uh, either for Roman or, or medieval scenes, um, and from many other literary sources as well. Theatrical historians have, have looked at pageants and seen them as, um, to use Baz Kershaw's term, spectacles of domination. Um, social historians have seen them as promoting an officially sanctioned civic image through, through drama. Um, Matthew Vickers' thesis on Liverpool, for example, um, has a very interesting chapter on, on the ways in which Liverpool tried to promote its civic image through, through its pageant in the Edwardian period and didn't succeed very, very well. Um, and others have suggested that the organisation and the content and the way in which they were performed um, supported the maintenance of what Michael Woods calls hegemonic power structures. Um, Woods, as I've said, looks at the Taunton pageant of 1928 um, in which the leading citizens of the town chaired all the important committees, all the organising committees. The pageants presented an elite version of history and emphasised the importance of, of middle-class social leadership um, taking place at a time of considerable social upheaval. The, the Taunton pageant emphasised the virtues of, of English constitutionalism and um, moderation in, in politics and these kinds of spectacles, this is St Albans, uh, the Elizabethan scene in the St Albans pageant, they emphasised hierarchy, leadership and, and so on. Now not everyone 
agrees with this. Uh, Paul, for example, and Deborah Sugg Ryan have both argued that pageants must um, have meant more than this. They weren't simply these kind of top down affairs reflecting and helping to entrench local hegemony. Um, they're um, they drew so many thousands of people to take part in them. Um, there was a genuine popular enthusiasm for the past. Um, and certainly if, as um, Michael Woods suggests, um, these pageants were intended to carry political and social messages, there's no guarantee that these messages actually got through to the participants in the way that the organisers hoped. The problem, of course, is that it's hard to find source material that tells us what the pageanteers, as they were usually called, thought themselves about what was going on. We tend to be reliant on the souvenir programmes, the scripts, the books of words, and the autobiographies of, of pageant masters such as Parker. So what I'm going to do is run through briefly um, a series of pageants in one city, St Albans. Um, it's a good example because there are three pageants, uh, 1907, 48 and 53, um, and in fact also a fourth in 1968, which I won't talk about today. St Albans is fairly typical of towns that held successful pageants in the Edwardian period, relatively small and with a very long Roman and medieval history, much more important in the past than in the present. Um, it was one of the early pageants, 1907, quite typical of the Parker style, although the pageant master was Herbert Jarman, uh, pictured here, who was recruited from the Lyric Theatre uh, and was paid quite a substantial fee for his services. The post-war pageants were um, <coughs> produced by Cyril Swinson, who was one of the um, most prominent of the post-war pageant masters. And, and who I may say more about later, and who went on to produce many more pageants in the 1950s, uh, even into the early 1960s. <laughs> so here's the 1907 pageant, 3,000 performers, grandstand capacity of 4,000, scripted by uh, local historian Charles Ashdown. And here are the eight historical episodes, ranging from Julius Caesar's invasion to Elizabeth I's visit to St Albans in, in 1572. Um, number of things to note about, about these episodes. Um, on the face of it, seems to be a very elitist, very conservative version of history based on the deeds of great men and women. Um, the modern scenes, insofar as they're modern at all, depicted kings and queens. Even the Peasants' Revolt um, scene featured a flattering depiction of Richard II. The scenes are all local, of course, that's the point of the pageant, um, but many of them were designed to, to recognise the role that the town had played in, in the national story, a matter of local pride for men like Ashdown. Nothing very recent, the latest episode was 1572. Similarly, Sherborne pageant ended with the um, visit of Walter Raleigh in 1593. Most very old, four pre-conquest scenes out of the eight that are um, being depicted, and the Elizabethan ending. Elizabeth I, as has often been pointed out, was the most popular character in Edwardian pageants. Um, so it's argued by David Glassberg and others because the Elizabethan period represented the last period of English history free from social conflict and industrialism. So Maypole and Morris dancing are a key feature of most historical pageants in this period and some historians like Glassberg see this as indicative of the anti-modernism of pageants. Most depicted very little after the Elizabethan period, harking back to a kind of pre-industrial golden age, which of course would fit with the widespread ruralism of this period which Alan Halkins has seen as being crucial to contemporaneous conceptions of Englishness, although other um, interpretations are certainly possible. We could spend a whole... Um, spend a whole evening just deconstructing the scripts and some historians, notably Yoshino, have done this valuably for some pageants, including St Albans, but I want to focus more on the context. There's a, there's a very bad reproduction of a, a line drawing of Boudicca from the pageant programme. There's a um, slightly better reproduction of the Peasants' Revolt. We call it a free trade socialistic labour movement of the 14th century. Um, there's the Earl of Warwick and his, his entourage, played by um, 
local historian um, Frederick Kinnear Tart. So is this anti-modernism like Glassberg um, argues conservative, this is a conservative spectacle. Aspects of the context certainly at first sight seem to support this interpretation. The civic conservation movement was emerging at about the same time. Um, in many English towns and, and St Albans, many of the same people were involved in both civic conservation and, and in the pageant. Um, the efforts on the whole to promote local history though, to use the pageant to um, actually interest people in getting involved in local history and visiting the museum, that kind of thing, were not as successful. The profits, which were fairly substantial, went to, to the museum, but the other local educational of, um, uh, activities that, that went on around the time of the pageant largely failed to enthuse the population. Lectures that were put on attracted only moderate attendances. Um, and in fact, the, um, the audiences even um, caused potential damage to the Roman walls and other, other ruins, so the, um, they had to be uh, protected from the visitors rather than becoming part of the, the wider attractions of, of the pageant. Promotion of tourism, uh, as Yoshino argues, is an important part of, um, of historical pageantry. So we can argue, I think, through this, and I think she's right about this, special trains were put on from London, for example, for visitors to come and see the pageant. Um, the pageant is serving an important purpose to um, promote and support the development of, of tourism in the town. And again, this is true of many many other places. And indeed the pageant supported local industry. Local industry is advertised in the programme um, and although this hasn't reproduced very well, there were pictures of the various industries that were flourishing in, in St Albans at this time, particularly printing but also many, many others as well. Um, and this, this was part of the, the wider civic promotion that was one of the aims of, of the pageant. <laughs> and it was done through um, a focus on civic identity, local patriotism, a phrase that was repeatedly thrown around by the local press uh, in St Albans and in many, many other places. William Chauncey Langdon, the most prominent of the American pageant masters, declared that the pageant is a drama in which the place is the hero and the development of the community is, is the plot. I don't think English pageants or British pageants were quite set up in this way in terms of the scripts, but they certainly, as events, performed a very similar function. They were there to promote local patriotism. Some have argued, Yoshino, for example, that the pageants <coughs> reflected imperialism um, and that empire was a strong theme running through the pageants. I would argue, though, that locality, and I know Paul has argued the same for the Edwardian period, I would argue that, that local identity is much more important and that the theme of many pageants is that the, the roots of national identity lie in the locality. That's what's um, most prominent about, about their, their message. <laughs> and this was meant to be promoted, according to men like Parker, by the organisation of the pageant itself. Parker said the pageant is a festival of brotherhood in which all distinctions of whatever kind were sunk in common effort. There's a real fantasy about pageants being um, communal activities. Um, <clears throat> Having said which, there were many opportunities to display um, what Keith Snell in an influential article has called the local xenophobia that was so characteristic of many English communities in this period. Um, many examples of um, labour conflicts, for example, over the construction of grandstands. 
in one fairly trivial but perhaps telling example from St Albans, um, the Hearts advertiser was rather critical of the failure of certain places to provide enough actors for the pageant. And one correspondent complained bitterly that episode three, the martyrdom of St Alban, had been offered to a group from the nearby village of Radlett, but he objected strongly to this because the martyrdom took place near the site of the pageant and it should be local St Alban's people who, who enacted it. And there are many examples of um, <clears throat> local rivalries coalescing around pageants as well as, um, as, well as being smoothed over by them. I'm going to skip over this slide for time. I want to move on to the, the post-war period. Um, and I think in many ways what, what strikes me about the post-war period is the similarity of the culture of historical pageantry with what we find in the Edwardian period that's much better known. I think these post-war pageants would have been quite recognisable in most cases to uh, men like Louis Napoleon Parker. The St Albans pageant of 1948 with a slightly smaller cast of about 1,000 um, and a choir of 200 uh, was one of the earliest of the um, big post-war historical pageants. Um, and as I've said, the pageant master was Swinson, who ended up doing lots of others. I put three examples up on here: Wisbeach, Hitchin, and Kings Lynn. But he did he did many other pageants in this period. And as I've said, there were coronation pageants at Sirencester, Warwick, many other places. Again, really up and down, up and down the country. Um, and here are the scenes. <laughs> um, Only three the same as in 1907, but in some cases we see very similar kinds of things being depicted. The founding of the Abbey in the Anglo-Saxon period, the martyrdom of, of Alban, the um, visit of Queen Elizabeth um, in, in 1570s. Um, a slight willingness to, you know, to depict some more recent scenes, the civil wars up there. There's an election scene of 1722, uh, and the last scene is actually from the Victorian period. Um, again, I think it's a focus on the kind of great men approach to history. As in 1907, there's very little, although not nothing, on the economic and social life of St Albans. Um, the urge to get the big historical figures in was so great that historical accuracy was tampered with, despite the efforts of Swinson to emphasise the fact that he'd used proper historical sources. The Duke of Marlborough appeared in the scene of 1722, for example, even though it's extremely unlikely he actually appeared in St Albans at that time. Um, and for the last scene, the creation of the diocese and the creation of the city uh, were conflated into a single episode. Both of them took place in 1877, although actually, in fact, three months apart. The last scene, interestingly, um, the, the, the councillors, the mayor and councillors of 1948 played their own predecessors from 1877, um, again showing that these, these, um, <coughs> these pageants are still seen as vehicles for urban governance and the, the display of um, urban civic leadership in one way or another. Um, that is episode it's episode 9. Again, you can't see it very well, but there's um, the mayor and, and councillors playing their, their predecessors uh, in, in 1877. What I would say about this is it's probably even more local in focus than the 1907 pageant. Um, <coughs> episode 3 here is... Um, depicts Abbot Alcinus laying out the town of St Albans at the traditional foundation date of 948, which was the excuse for having the pageant being the millenary of that particular um, traditional date of foundation. In 1953, again, it's Swinson, 4,000 seats in the grandstand, so it's a big, um, big event, and more than 1,600 performers um, the fact that it made a loss of £1,200 in common with many uh, pageants in this period uh, would be one reason probably why no further large-scale 
pageants were, were held. Um, <coughs> This is slightly different because um, it's a coronation pageant and it's based on, on queens, that's the theme, so Swinson's choice is somewhat um, restricted, but it's all different queens who, in one way or another, visited um, the town of St Albans over the previous 2,000 years. The weather one were called Boudicca's trip or visit is another matter, but um, <laughs> their visits visits to the town, one kind or another. Queen Victoria, I put in brackets, because um, <coughs> Queen Victoria never visited the town as queen, but they um, found a way of, of sneaking her in by the back door. Didn't actually appear in the scene, but they were able to say how nice it would have been if she, if she had. Again, you see the bias is much more towards the earlier period here, and it's not, not much after the Elizabethan, the first Elizabethan period. I'll just put a few more examples, just to show this is not totally untypical, although there are some variations. Um, Swinson's King's Lynn Charter pageant of 1954, the 750th anniversary of the Charter, narrated by the, the Spirit of Lynn. Ten scenes, again, a bit more willingness than in earlier pageants to depict the 18th and 19th centuries, but the focus tending to be on, on the earlier period. And occasionally we see a mythical in this case, King Arthur, or a fictional character, Tom Brown, in the Warwickshire pageant, um, cropping up um, in these um, pageants. Anthony Parker, well, again, one of the most prominent pageant masters of the post-war period, was the grandson of, of Louis Napoleon Parker. Um, and this pageant did... Um, very much reflect the traditions of the, of the Parker pageants. Lots of Elizabethan merrymaking, and of course Shakespeare playing a very big role, as one would expect in, in a, a Warwickshire pageant. So there's, there's an innate conservatism in some respects behind the pageantry of this period, to which Swinson and others fully subscribed, and the emphasis on loyalty is very striking. Swinson says loyalty is the pageant theme, not only to the monarchy, but also that's best and highest in life, writing in the context of, of 1953. Um, but I think it's emphasising more than anything civic loyalty. Here's one of the postcards produced for the pageant, and it's not a postcard of one of the scenes, as was the case with the postcards produced in 1907, but it's actually a postcard of the town, and it's the town hall with a banner advertising the pageant hung outside it. There was a pageant hymn here and elsewhere that said how wonderful St Albans was, or, or Guildford was, or whichever town it was in. The pageant hymn at St Albans was, was sung at both 48 and 53, and it remained in the civic consciousness for quite some time, and it was even sung bizarrely at Swinson's funeral in, in 1963. So I think despite the, the experience of the World Wars and, and the promotion of a, of a sort of national culture by institutions, particularly the BBC, um, the local roots of identity are still a very prominent theme in pageants, and I would suggest actually even more prominent than in the Edwardian period. And it was used, this civic loyalty, to um, inspire particular activities in the present. Not, not just the pageant itself, but the whole planned development of the town here and elsewhere. The city surveyor contributed a um, section to the programme um, called St Albans Past, Present and Future, which set out the vision of the planned town. St Albans had been one of the expansion towns after the... Uh, Second World War. There was even a suggestion at the planning stage that the 1948 pageant should um, have a, sec uh, a scene depicting the future, which would have been an innovation for a pageant, but that, that never, never materialised. Again, local industries are being presented, being promoted, advertised in the pageant programme. Local factories invited people visiting the pageant to come and look around their factories. And I think what we see in the pageant literature of this period, both, both here and elsewhere, is um, an emphasis on the present as being the connecting link between past and future. And this is much stronger um, in the post-war pageants than in those 
in the Edwardian period. It's a period of rapid post-war change, and for Swinson, the big concern is this, that suburban development, the growth of a commuter population, um, might damage the civic life of the city, and things like the pageant would help to prevent that from happening. Yes, it's very important to encourage new residents to come and live in the town, new um, industries to locate themselves in the town, but it's also important to ensure that this doesn't compromise the, the civic life. So I think in some ways the local focus and the, the importance of protecting civic life is actually um, emphasised more in the post-war pageants. Um, and just to plug my forthcoming article in Social History, that's what I've argued in there, coming out in November of this year. Um, but I think this emphasis on the present as the connecting link between the past and the future reflects what historians are beginning to agree, I think, about the nature of the way history was presented in the Festival of Britain, which at one time was seen as determinedly modernist in spirit. But historians like Becky Conakin and more recently Harriet Atkinson have argued that the presentation of history in the festival reflected a sense of timeless traditions, that progress was possible within, with, within a sense of, of larger, larger histories, that um, a wider exercise of, of historical re-evaluation, to use Atkinson's term, was going on, informed by a search to reconcile past and present. Um, and um, there was a shared body of tradition that was being presented through the festival, which resulted in a kind of more a more sort of evolutionary <laughs> vision of of the national past. And I think histor historical pageants did the same but at a much more local level. Even the medieval mystery plays um, could be seen as attempts to bring the past into the present. Um, Heather Weber suggests that these plays recall the pageant tradition. Um, very large casts, outdoor locations. Um, and in the case of Coventry, they were performed in, in the ruins of the cathedral. So although the scenes were set a very long time ago in the, the distant or even arguably mythical past, the tradition itself was medieval, but the context of more recent events could, could hardly be forgotten. So what are we going to do in our project? Um, we're going to spend the next three years looking at these things. Um, and I just want to kind of finish by introducing the project and the questions that we're, we're going to be asking. And we have a collaborative AHRC funded project, £976,000, which we've got to spend somehow. Um, between us, Paul and Paul, myself and Angela, um, we have various others working with us on the project, including Charlotte, uh, Tom Hume, Miguel Vieira, and Linda Fleming at Glasgow. And what we're going to be doing is creating an interactive website, and here is the URL, historicalpageants.ac.uk, where we're going to um, <coughs> place and create a large volume of material, uh, textual and visual, on historical pageants during the 20th century, and we'll be encouraging members of the public to upload their pictures, artefacts, and texts as well. We're going to be producing a monograph on historical pageants and an international conference. The one thing that I haven't said anything about today is the international dimension, um, with historical pageantry being very popular in the United States, in Japan, um, South Africa, Canada, and, and many other places. Lascelles himself um, produced pageants in I think, both Canada and South Africa. And the USA certainly has a very flourishing tradition of historical pageantry in the first third of the 20th century. We'll be working with project partners, um, <coughs> Tully House Museum in Carlisle, um, St Edmundsbury, St Albans, Uttlesford, and uh, we're hoping to attract other project partners over the course of the next three years. We will be um, staging exhibitions, witness seminars, um, and encouraging project partners to interact with, with our website. 
<clears throat> and our ambition is to collect data from every single pageant with a significant archival record. Um, my latest guesstimate um, is about 10,000 pageants were probably held in the 20th century. Now, luckily, not all of these have left a significant archival record, but we have got quite a lot of um, work to do. And here's what we're going to be asking. <laughs> How did the choice of episodes change over time? How were particular episodes presented? It's clear just from St Albans that the way the Peasants' Revolt was presented in 1907 and uh, 1948 or 1968 differed significantly. What's the balance of emphasis on local, national and imperial identities? How are these identities inflected through the scripts and the organisation of pageants? And how does that evolve over time? Are we talking about conservative nostalgia? Are we talking about a body of timeless traditions? Are we talking about a kind of guide to the future? How are these conceived by those who create them, produce them and write them, and also by those who participate in them, who um, form, who stand there in the medieval armies, who um, don't necessarily have the big speaking roles, don't write the scripts, but um, take part get dressed up and, and have fun while they're doing it. What's the role of professional historians? How does this ostensibly amateur activity tie in with the development of um, history at a professional level and indeed in, in schools? All these questions are going to occupy our minds for large parts of, of the next, um, next three years. So the nature of today's paper... Um, and I'm sorry if it's kind of turned into a bit of an extended advert for the project that we're doing. The nature has been very much to um, ask questions. Um, so any conclusions would be tentative at best. But I would conclude by arguing that the historical pageant doesn't need to be seen as the kind of conservative, anti-modernist spectacle that it's sometimes shown as in, in the literature. It can bring the past into the service of the present in many new ways, and it can evolve to adapt to changing circumstances and changing social sensibilities. So I make three points, really. Historical pageants remained a key feature of British life until at least the mid-1950s, something that's often not recognised. They, they brought the past into the service of the civic present and were a key way of promoting the civic image and local patriotism of towns by many local authorities, um, even in the challenging context of the 1950s. And something I haven't touched on, but I think is very important, they can themselves be the site of local conflict, not so much over the content of the scenes necessarily, but often over the organisation of the pageants. And I think they emphasise the continuing importance of localism, local identity in popular culture, well into the second half of the 20th century and maybe beyond.